Welcome to African Roots, brought to you by DW. In this podcast series, we discover how individuals from across Africa shape the continent. I'm Leila Johnson Salami. And I'm Kai Nebe. Okay, so full disclosure, um, <laughs> this episode has a lot to do with conflict. Yes, uh, we're going to be discussing war and military minds, Leila. Mm-hmm. And on that, there's probably no one better to start with than Shaka Zulu. So that's the theme song of the TV show Shaka Zulu produced in the late 1980s. We are growing, growing well, Leila, it sounds like quite an, an uplifting song there. Yep, a very uplifting song, Kai. I mean, especially as it's about a leader who essentially changed the makeup of Southern Africa in the early 1800s. Well, Leila, now, the thing is, I come from Southern Africa and... Where I come from, Shaka has, how do we say, always had a bit of a mm, sort of mixed reputation, depending on who you ask. I mean, that is true. Uh, mixed is a bit of an understatement. Some people do see him as a great unifier of the Zulu nation and a military genius. Others see him as this bloodthirsty invader who spread tyranny across parts of modern day South Africa, also Lesotho, Botswana, Mozambique and Eswatini. But you know, what everyone can agree on, Kai, is that King Shaka did change Southern Africa forever. Like, take me through it, Leila. So let's start at the beginning. So Shaka wasn't exactly born destined for greatness, I must say. Um... He was born in July in 1787 in the area that's today known as KwaZulu-Natal. He was born out of a love affair as well between unmarried Prince Senzanga Kona and Princess Nandi, something that put Senzanga Kona's ascendance to the throne in jeopardy. That's as it wasn't really acceptable, you know, for the heir apparent to have a child out of wedlock. Long story short here, um, after trying to weasel his way out of the union, Senzanga Kona and Princess Nandi did get married, but eventually Senzanga Kona threw both Shaka and Nandi out. Wait, so you're telling me that Shaka was actually just raised by a single mom then? Yeah, he was, and we'll get into this, Kai. But first, Shaka and his mum sought refuge at the Umtetwa clan um, that was led by King Dingiswayo. Now, Dingiswayo recruited Shaka into a regiment for young men. And let's just say that's where he proved to be a capable warrior. He was extraordinarily agile. That's Dr. Maxwell Zakele Shamase, um, an expert on the history of the Zulu nation at the University of Zululand in South Africa. Um, he credits Shaka with turning the Zulu nation into this formidable fighting force. Now, remember this was an army fighting with spears, not firearms. And uh, he turned around the Mteto army and said, no, 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 man. We can't fight wearing a sander. We must be barefooted. He said, no, let's change these long spears into short stepping asagai. Quick note here, in Southern Africa, an asagai is a javelin-type weapon. He was exceptional in everything he was doing. So, Leila, Shaka, basically, after a tough start in life, finds a home in the Zulu army. But how did this affect the, his standing in his clan? Good question. I mean, Kai, the story of Shaka is not complete, right? It's without a dose of familial infighting. Um, when his father, Senzanga Kona, died, Shaka returned to his people and um, he killed his half-brother, Sijujwana. That was the heir apparent. And then he took over power in 1816. Now, this meant that he controlled the Zulu army and an army that he had equipped, by the way, with new beliefs, weapons and tactics. So I'm guessing that peace was not the first thing on, on Shaka's mind at this stage, right? Not for Shaka. Um, his leadership saw the Zulu army become a lot more warlike. Um, warriors spent most of their time in the bush raiding other clans, and it was common for the Zulu nation to take in women and children, but they would kill all military-aged men and the elderly that could not run away. So first, all the Zulu clans fell under Shaka's great kingdom. So 
How did this then affect non-Zulu communities? Well, they were often absorbed into the expanding kingdom or they were forced to flee. Just for a bit of context, um, the Zulu nation expansion started in eastern South Africa, but it spread all the way up to Botswana. This rippling effect is known as the Mfekane, which translates to the crushing or the scattering. I mean, that is a huge, expansive territory, what you're describing there, Leila. But can you really say that this was all down to Shaka? Well, many historians do see him as a key part, Kai. Um, From a military view, he's been compared to great commanders. Some Europeans called him the Black Napoleon, um, which, of course, Dr. Shamase does not like. Why can't Napoleon be a white Shaka? We're collecting that version. He was a nation builder, not a bloodthirsty killer or ruthless assassin, as is described uh, by Westerners. Right, okay. But Leila, what was Shaka like as a leader? Like, this is, I think, where the controversy comes, right? Yeah, so this is sort of where the controversy does come. Um, Bluntly speaking, he did have a tyrannical streak. Um, His military genius on the battlefield gave him the reputation of a nation builder. But as king, Shaka's record had all sorts of red flags. He was accused of killing women that he impregnated, and warriors returning from the battlefield with spear wounds on the back were sent to his headquarters. It was even called Kwabulawayo, and that translates to a place of killing, to be finished off for being cowards, basically. Oh God, Leila, that... uh... I'm sorry, that sounds quite, uh, that's almost disturbing. I I told you, controversy is a bit of an understatement here. But you know, there are also many stories of indiscriminate killing of rival tribes as well. But Shamase believes that the death of his mother really flipped a switch in Shaka. His brutality would also become his downfall. We would just command his, I mean, go and wipe out that clan over there. I don't want to see it anymore. Kill those people who, who had persecuted him while he was young. And then Nkawai Kacham said, no, it's time we must bring an end to this. Let's kill him. He's dead, King Shah. That's how he died. My goodness. I mean, <laughs> Leila, it is quite, it does sound like a very brutal life then that Shaka led. Yeah. And I get that he was this military genius, but that ruthlessness that he displayed was, and his, maybe his lack of diplomacy, like, was that, Was that kind of his undoing? In a way it was, Kai, and you know, your sentiments are also not illogical here, but a lot of the information that we have, I must say, comes from journals by European and oral history, so it's not necessarily reliable. Um, Moreover, the historical Mfakane, that was an episode which some historians now believe the apartheid government pushed to foment this idea um, that South Africa was a cesspit of black-on-black violence. Okay, so during apartheid, then I can imagine that any reference to Shaka must have been kind of always seen in a negative light. Or simply ignored. Remember, for almost half a century under apartheid, South Africans were taught that their history began when Europeans arrived. Okay, so now now apartheid has passed. I mean, it ended in um, 1994. So how has Shaka... The history of Shaka being looked at since then. Like, how is his legacy? Like, the more we know about Shaka, like, has his reputation improved or something? Well, it's still mixed, but more positive. Here's Mtadeni Patrick Mbata, um, a PhD history student at the University of Zululand. King Shaka's history is the one that makes Zulu people today to have a strong sense of identity and belonging. Today they still stand united under one king. His history is still relevant and it is what informs patriotism, culture, future and inheritance. Still relevant. You know, Eastern South Africa, the traditional home of the Zulu people, is full of references to Shaka. Even Durban's International Airport, as I'm sure you know, Kai, is named after King Shaka. Yeah, Shaka. He does seem, though, still a very divisive figure, though. Absolutely. Well, you know, Shaka's story and the telling of it, I'd say, is an interesting clash between Western and African histories. Um, There certainly are some facts that both sides agree on. But like Shamase alludes to, depending on which Europeans you ask about Napoleon, for example, you are likely to get very different responses, let's be honest. Uh, that's, That's certainly true.
When we come back, we meet an Ethiopian who fought for an empire, but never lived to see it. DW African Roots. Find new African Roots episodes on dw.com slash African Roots, Spotify, iTunes, and wherever you get your podcasts. This is African Roots. I'm Kai Nebe, and I'm here with... Me, Leila Johnson Salami. I'm still alive, Kai. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I've got someone for you. I know. I'm curious to know about this Ethiopian fighter that you mentioned. Yes, and he is not dissimilar to Shaka Zulu in some ways, but their circumstances are very different. Mm. And who is the mysterious man, Kai? Well, I'm going to introduce you to Gobena Dace. He was a general and a conqueror, and he served under Sahle Mariam, a king of Shewa, who would later go on to become Ethiopia's emperor, Menelik II. And uh, Gobena was considered Menelik's right-hand man who helped uh, the emperor established power over vast territories of um, what is now known as Ethiopia. He expanded the Ethiopian Empire and in later years, Menelik fought off the Italians at the Battle of Adwa, which is one of the reasons why Ethiopia avoided colonization like its African neighbors to the west and uh, to the south. Oh, wow. So Gobena was quite a big deal then. Well, you you, you definitely could say that. And um, here's Professor Shumed Shishanye of the University of Bahia Da, which is near Lake Tana in northern Ethiopia. And he explains just why Gobena Dace is so important to Ethiopian history. He is remembered as uh, one of the key uh, lieutenants of uh, Menelik. He is an empire builder. Uh, I'm sure people know about the massive expansion uh, that uh, Menelik carried out in the second half of the 19th century. And much of it uh, was done, uh, really, uh, with the assistance of uh, Governor Dace. Uh, he joined Menelik very early on, and uh, together they were able to reshape present-day uh, Ethiopia. Okay, um, that, that is quite impressive. I'm interested, though, in knowing... Um how he established himself, Kai? Well, some background here. Gobena was born into an aristocratic Ethiopian family. Um, over the years, his family had built up close ties with Menelik. And Gobena had a military upbringing and he gained a reputation as a soldier. And by the time he was 40, he'd pledged allegiance to Menelik. Uh, he and other noblemen viewed Menelik as the rightful king, um, of Shewa. Interesting. And just for the dynamics and the play here, um, why was that important in terms of the person that Gobena then ended up becoming? So in Ethiopia, royalty and particularly the claim to the throne was always determined by your ability to trace your ancestry back to the house of David. You have to remember that Ethiopia was a Solomonic dynasty. And that meant that if you could trace your heritage back to the king of David of Israel, and I'm talking about the king of David, David from the Bible, um, that was basically your ticket to um, being close to the royal family or, in fact, having a chance to become a king. Ethiopia was ruled this way for thousands of years, essentially by one dynasty. Mm -mm. Well, I guess that rules most of us out then. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, I mean, certainly for me, yeah, that definitely rules me out anyway. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. <laughs> this is an interesting fact, though. Um, up until King Menelik uh, took the throne, he was actually imprisoned by the then emperor of Ethiopia, Teodros II. Um, so why did Gobena Dace then support him if he was imprisoned? Yeah, well, yes, I also wondered that, which is why I asked uh, historian Hewan Simon, she says that uh, Gobena Dace and other generals fiercely supported King Menelik uh, because they knew that they themselves would otherwise have no shot at being considered uh, the elite in Ethiopia or any of their other political prospects or ambitions would, would not be able to be carried forward. But some argue it's because he saw the growing power of uh, Shawa and Menelik at the time. Um, as opposed to the other rulers of the, the country. And also because he would not be able to claim the throne without some sort of political marriage into uh, 
the house of David. Ah, so he was a strategist. And uh, also a very good strategist. And Bernard Dutch's loyalty did in the end pay off. Um, early on, after Menelik escaped from Emperor Theodros II, he made Gobena Dace his chief of the palace. That was a very that was very important because it meant you were very close to the king. He also gave Gobena Dace the royal title Ras, which is ranked just below Menelik's own position of king or Negus. Um, here's Shumit Sheshanye again to explain the bond between Menelik and Gobena Dace. Gobena became one of two Rases made by Menelik. The other one was Ras Darke. Menelik's own uncle, so that will give you some idea of how close Gwena was to Menelik. Uh, Menelik appointed two races in 1878, so only two races. Interesting. So the the royal ras title is basically just below Menelik's position. So I'm guessing that means it's like a general. Yeah, basically something like a right hand man. Ah. Interesting. And there were there were two races in charge of running the territory for Menelik. Essentially, yes. But Gobena Dace is the better known one. And he forged alliances, fought battles and even made sure that local leaders paid tribute and pledged uh, loyalty to Menelik. If uh, we want to kind of uh, put this in a modern context, he was sort of the enforcer, I guess, of Menelik's rule. And Professor Shinshanye again explains just why his position was so important there. He was appointed over areas that have their own traditional chiefs, etc. But these were largely petty principalities, small chiefdoms uh, and tribal chiefs, etc., etc. And he declared that those who submitted peacefully and paid their tributes uh, would be accepted peacefully and those who resisted would be forcefully forcefully incorporated. Mm, Those who resisted were forcefully incorporated. I'm guessing this is where we get to the controversy, Kai. (laughs) Yeah, so Gobena Dace and Menelik both dreamt of restoring what they thought of as the old Ethiopian empire that had existed 300 years back in the 14th and 15th century. And that, of course, meant that they would have to reclaim power over areas that they had uh, or at least that they believed should be part of that. And not all of it went peacefully. If you consider Emperor Menelik's empire as an Ethiopian empire and not just um, through one ethnic group's uh, expansion, and that is exactly what uh, Gobena believes, I, I would say, was going on at the time, then you'd say, oh, he was a great unifier. In case you see it in the other sense, though, that you would say, yeah, this is a, a, a expansionist force of the northern Ethiopian Empire that came to, that was enabled to control southern Ethiopia because of one of their own sons. That was historian Hewan again. Okay, so we we know that Dace was a strategist, um, a military leader. And very controversial. But Kai, you know, I'm very interested in also knowing what his personal character was like. Yeah, and unfortunately, there is not much known about what kind of personal character Gobena Dace had. Uh, Historians do describe him as being uh, extremely loyal and devoted to Menelik. And he was a military man all the way to his death. Professor Sishanya even says that Gobena Dace and Menelik's military efforts also strengthened Ethiopia to the extent that it could resist colonial advances from uh, European countries. This was a time when much of Africa uh, was facing enormous uh, pressure from uh, European empire builders. Remember, the Berlin Conference was in 1884. And Gouverna was at the peak of, of his career in 1884. By 1884, they have largely established centralized control over a good portion of the south and the southwestern parts of Ethiopia. The area really to the south of Addis Ababa was largely incorporated, centralized, and organized. So, you know, earlier on, you mentioned resisting colonial forces. Just to backtrack a bit, are we talking about the British? Yes, uh, the British as well. The British were, of course, colonizing East Africa, which would become Kenya and also Sudan, Egypt to the north, but also 
the Italians who were closing in from the north. So, so what happened next? Did Gobernadace get a promotion or lead Ethiopia himself? Well, this is kind of the anticlimax of Gobernadace's story. It ended early for him. After dedicating his entire life to building an empire with Menelik, uh, Gobernadace died a few months before Menelik officially ascended the throne in 1889. Oh, Y- yikes. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> I did not um, see that coming. <laughs> and so a few years later, that's only when Emperor Menelik finally defeated the Italians at the famous Battle of Adwa. And that is how Ethiopia remained the only African nation uh, never to have been colonized in that first initial scramble for Africa. I, I certainly see the parallels. I must say, I don't know if you'd agree with me, um, between Shaka and Gobernadace especially in terms of that desire that they both seem to have had to incorporate other ethnic groups into this bigger empire. Yes, um, and I guess, though, one of the differences one could argue is that uh, the the Zulu empire that Shaka created within South Africa, I guess, was prefaced around the idea of the Zulu nation, whereas the Ethiopian nation seemed to be more at the center of uh, Gobena Dace and Menelik's uh, uh, ambitions. No, very true. I do agree with you on that. And, you know, maybe that has also a lot to do with at the time when Gobena Dace was around, there was already the scramble for Africa where European nations were really basically land grabbing left, right and center, which forced Ethiopia to become what it became. That's where we'll have to leave things for today. African Roots is a cooperation between Deutsche Welle and the Gerda Henkel Foundation. Special thanks to our producers Jürgen Kuhn, Philip Zantner and our voiceover artists. Contributions by Tuso Komalo and Sela Oneko. I'm Kai Nebe. And I'm Leila Johnson-Salami. 